You know, it was funny. Um, first of all, just Ann and I, my wife, um, we want to thank you guys, um, Waxer and, and One Love, for having us here. Um, as Waxer said, you know, this has kind of been in, in the making in, on his heart and on uh, my heart for a while now. And so God finally brought it to fruitation. And I hope you guys are going to be blessed um, with what's going on here. And it was so funny sitting there, you know, when I used to be here, part of the One Love team, Wax and I would do stuff like this, um, these, you know, times of prophecy and stuff. And it was so funny listening to him because it's almost role reversal now. Because I would be the guy yelling out, look at all the signs. And now I'm the guy bringing the theology. And he used to be the guy bringing the theology. And so it's so cool to, to do that. But I can actually, we can actually end the conference right now. Seriously. And real simple, real simple way. With everything that Waxer brought um, to the table, with all the, what's going on in the world and all of that, we can simply end the conference this way if you believe the word of God to be true. In Matthew 24, verse 11, Yeshua is giving out, you know, the, the signs of the times, what things going to look like before he returns. And in verse 11, he said that the love of many, because of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. And he's talking about in the last days before he returned. You know what is the Greek word for cold? Psycho. It's the word psycho. Because the love of many will grow psycho. And this is what we see going on. Just this craziness that's going on. Okay, what I do back home is as a teacher, one of the things we try, I try not to do is I want people to think, okay? And so I ask a lot of questions and I ask the congregation, raise your hand, you know, on this. Yes, no, where, where you see this? Okay, so I'm going to start off this way tonight. How many of you seen the movie Princess Bride? Raise your hand. Well, keep your hands up, keep your hands up, Princess Bride. All right. I was blessed all the way back in Molokai to be introduced into that movie by Waxer and Cindy, Okay. And it's still one of my favorite movies. In fact, two weeks ago, I watched it with my two young Mo'opunas, my grandchildren. And one of them was the first time they seen him, and my granddaughter was the second time she's seen him. We're just loving it. But in that movie, right, there's a, a lot of, you have to put your hands down. <laughs> in that movie, there's a lot of memorable lines, right? I mean, there's lines that came out of that movie that people repeat all the time, right? Vicini. The, the Sicilian kidnapper, right? He kidnaps the princess, right? What was his line? Inconceivable. Inconceivable, right? I was his line. Every time anything messed up, inconceivable. But then the most memorable line out of that movie is from my favorite character in the movie, which was Indigo Montoya, right? The Spanish swordsman. And everybody knows the line about the six-fingered man. And he's talking to Wesley, the, the hero of the movie, and he tells him this because he's bent on that movie. In that movie, he's just bent on vengeance for his father's murder by the six-fingered man. And he's sitting there and he's telling Wesley what he will do. And he'll, when I see the six-fingered man, I will go up to him and I will say, hello, my name is Indigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. But then I was watching this interview of the actor, the guy who played Indigo Montoya, and he was saying, it wasn't until a few years later when he was actually watching a movie again himself that he realized the most powerful line that came out of the movie. And that's, it's at the end, and it's again from Indigo Montoya. And it's after he's got his revenge on his dad's murder, and he's standing there talking to Wesley again, he's got some wounds, sword wounds from the, the fight with the six-fingered man, and he looks at Wesley. And he goes, you know, it's very strange. I've been in the revenge business for so long. Now that it's over, I don't know what to do with the rest of my life. <laughs> and you know, there's some of us when it comes to prophecy. We hear things, we, we, we've been in it for so long that we hear something, we hear a different perspective, and we go, it's very strange. <laughs> I've been in the prophecy camp for so long, now I don't know what to do with this. And that's so true. It's so true because there are many good Bible teachers out there. 
prophecy Bible teachers. But for some reason, when it comes to prophecy, all we think about is end times. That's it. Prophecy. Oh, book of Revelation, book of Daniel. Whoa, wait a minute. What about the prophecies fulfilled? Jesus born in Bethlehem. Born of a virgin. These prophecies. And we minimize biblical prophecy down to end times. And why did that happen? Why did that happen? We disconnected what has happened. We disconnected prophecy from its supernatural. And I, you can hear me hear that, say that word a lot. And just understand supernatural this way. Not the weird whacked out stuff. Okay. But just simply this. Superior over the natural. That's what the word super means. Superior over the natural. Okay. So outside of our natural, there's something super. And we all know who that is and what that is, right? Okay? Now, we've disconnected prophecy from that. There's a timeline, guys, in this book. And it's God's timeline. How did we get here? Well, we're following God's timeline, even with all the craziness that's going on. As Waxer said, guess what? God is still in control, gang. God is still in control. What is the number one sign of COVID? Fever. Cough. What? Which one? Fear. The number one sign of the COVID virus is fear. Fear of losing, fear of dying, fear of losing friends, fear of losing money. Gee, and Paul told Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear. But yet we see so many believers living in fear. And that's my heart behind of this. I can bring some things to your ear that might be very strange. <laughs> but I'm asking this of you, and I'm challenging you on this. Is this Acts 17:11? Paul said that the, the believers in Berea were more noble-minded, that their way of thinking was higher than them in Thessalonica. Why? Because he says very clearly that they received the word with eagerness, but they examined the word daily to see if it was true. So before you get on your texting and your, your um, computer, whatever, to right now comment, I challenge you to first pray about it. Because I'm not the ultimate teacher, the Holy Spirit is. Okay? I'm just the messenger. You like, shoot the messenger, shoot the messenger, but that doesn't change truth, guys. All right? And so I'm going to bring some things that I said might be very strange to your ears tonight. People ask me as a pastor, they go, wait, Kahu, what do you think we are on the prophetic line, timeline of God right now? And you guys, some of you who do know me, you guys know, you sat under some of my teachings where I used to teach what I call event-driven prophecy. Oh, look at this event. It goes over here. This event goes over here. And sometimes it's like trying to fit one round peg in a square hole. Okay? And before we left um, Oahu to go to the big island, the Lord really put it on my heart to really begin to understand prophecy. That guess what? It's about him. It's about him. Psalms 40 verse 7. Behold, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. It's written about him, guys. Okay? Book of Revelation says that the spirit of prophecy is who? Yeshua. It's Jesus. Okay? Look. Waxer has a lot of isms, right? You guys call them Waxer isms, right? I told Waxer the other day, slowly I'm coming up with some of my own. And when people ask me this, where are we? Where are we on God's timeline? My simple answer now, it may sound flippant, but it's not. It's true. You know what is my answer? Right on schedule. You think this took God by surprise? There's a timeline. God's on schedule, guys. Okay? And for us, one of my isms that I came up with is this. Our, our hindsight, okay, meaning that you're a believer, you know, Jesus is your Lord, Savior, all of this. Sometimes that very hindsight can ruin insights into scripture. Because you come with preconceived notions, preconceived theology, preconceived whatever, and sometimes that very whatever 
becomes a filter. What is filters for? Filters are to remove, whether it's oil filter, gas filter, air filter, whatever, right? It's designed to remove. And believe it or not, guys, we put on filters all the time when we read the scriptures. We put on filters, Christian filters, denominational filters, preconceived ideas. And sometimes those filters remove things that would actually enhance the scriptures. Enhance your relationship with God. Grow in a deeper understanding of God. And so again, I'm going to challenge you on that. Before you get on your... Pray. Take the time. And see if it's true. Don't let your filter ruin some wonderful insight that God has for you the next few days. Okay? See, one of the things we try and do as believers... We try and read from the Old Testament, I mean, from the New Testament back into the Old Testament. We try and read things in, uh, that has been fulfilled, and we try and read it back into the Old Testament, and really it's designed the other way. You have to read from the Old Testament, understand it, and then come into the New. That's why when people tell me this, they go, oh yeah, Brian, you know what? The Old Testament, we don't need them. We're New, Christian, um, we're new Testament church. I go, brother. You ain't got one sword, all you got is one butter knife. <laughs> okay? It's the whole book that we need. And the foundation of the New Testament is actually the Old Testament. Yeshua himself said in Luke 24, post resurrection, after the road to Emmaus, he said, he talking to his disciples, he said this. He said, Did not the Messiah have to fulfill everything that was written about him in the Psalms? The prophets, the writing, um, the, the, the um, Torah. He said, it's about me. And so guess what, guys? That means prophecy is about him too. It's about him. The number one sign of COVID is really fear, guys. So we have a responsibility to the world that is living in fear right now. And that is to help them to understand that the only fear they really need is the fear of God. Look, before, before I, I was saved, before I got saved some 20 some years ago, I was a drug dealer, okay? I used to deal dope. You know what I say now, I tell people all the time, I say, you know what, I used to be on dope dealer, now I'm a hope dealer. <laughs> My question becomes, what about you? We see, and we're actually going, as he closes tomorrow, we're going to look some more why these signs are here. But do you jump on the bandwagon with the people, and even in the body of Christ, that are overwhelmed with this stuff, and try and defend your position instead of seeing their heart? And why are they so fearful? Because well, everything we actually laid out is true. It's happening. You can't deny that one. So what are we going to do about it? That's what this is about, this next couple of days. So as Wax just said at the beginning, if you came thinking, you know, going to be the latest, greatest, you know, what's happening in Israel, Middle East kind of stuff, that's real. You got to pay attention. Jesus says, stay on the alert. Matthew 24, Matthew 25, all this stuff, stay on the alert. But that doesn't mean we get consumed by it. See, the end times need to be framed with it in supernatural origins. If not, we will miss the overall picture and purpose for it. Okay? The worldview of prophecy of most Christians, okay? The worldview of most prophecy of most Christians is based on politics, bad science, bad religion, geopolitical, whatever. And I call it hanging out at the signs. Hanging out at the signs. David Tomala is sitting over the corner over there, and he and I was talking about this. He's up in my house on a big island a couple weeks ago. I was talking about how some of our brothers in ministry, that's their whole focus. And we're talking about how, you know, they said all of this stuff. And for what, though? We have to stay on the alert. That's a commandment. But that doesn't mean we hang out at the signs. Okay? My wife and I, you guys know we live on the big island, right? Okay? Probably the number one thing on a big island, if you've never been there or your first time there, is go see the volcano. Right? Okay? Everybody wants to go see the volcano. So you leave Kona or you leave Hilo, whatever, there's those mile marker signs, volcano 100 miles, volcano 50 miles, volcano 20 miles, volcano 5 miles. 
Next left, Volcano National Park, okay? Every time Ann and I went up that way, not once I seen the tourists all hanging out at the signs and go, oh, we made it. You know, see the family all oh, oh, with their cameras taking pictures. We're at the volcano and they got 10 miles more to go. But if you've never been to the volcano, I can guarantee you, as you see those mile markers count down, what happens? Excitement, anticipation. We can see one of nature's, God's creation, one of the craziest things. If you never saw it, it's pretty crazy. And so there's an anticipation and excitement. They're not hanging out at the signs. And what has happened, we, because we turn prophecy into end time stuff only, then we just hang out at the signs. And yet Yeshua said in Luke 21, the parallel to Matthew 24, he says, when you see these things, kick the can, get bummed out, get all fearful. What he said? Look up. Straighten up, look up, because your redemption draws near. I don't know about you guys, okay? Jason asked me when we was communicating about this. He, he was kind of joking, and he said this to me. He said, what, Dave? You think Jesus is going to come back before the conference? <laughs> and I said, he better. We're running out of genders. <laughs> see, guys, as we see these things unfolding, we're right on schedule. The signs are there. We need to pay attention to them. But at the same time, it should not be driving any fear in us. It sh we should be rejoicing because our redemption draws near. That's the deal, guys. That's what this is about, okay? So, the supernatural worldview of the Bible, okay? When God was inspiring the writers of the Bible, the prophets, Moses, all of these guys, okay? You have to understand something. The prevailing worldview surrounding this was supernatural. The prevailing worldview around this was supernatural. Meaning that these pagan nations around Israel were into supernatural. Their gods, their worship, everything. Okay? You got to understand that what I'm going to try to help us do is put this in its original context. Okay? Not the context just of the content, but the original context of when God gave man this. It wasn't given in the 21st century, guys. It wasn't given to defend science. It's a theological book, guys. And the theology is about God, who is, by the way, Supernatural. Superior over the natural. That's what was surrounding this. See, the prevailing worldviews of the day was this supernatural. All the cultures were supernaturally minded. Okay? But see, this is our problem. Okay? When we start talking about this kind of stuff, okay, we see, I know as Christians, like, ooh, I don't know. Well, listen to here. Let me, let me make this statement. Just because a worldview is not based on God's truth, okay? And that's what we was looking at, all these signs, okay? Just because a worldview is not based on God's truth does not mean there isn't a reality connected to it. Let that one sink in for a moment. Just because the worldview, whatever it may be, and we've seen a whole bunch of them, is not based on the truth of the word of God, that doesn't mean there is a reality. There's a reality connected to it. Let me illustrate it this way. A few years ago, right, um, the volcano was just going off. Homes was being destroyed. My daughter-in-law sitting right there. They almost lost their home, okay? In the midst of this, you know, because we were in Hawaiian church and all this, so I get the question, hey, God, well, what do you think, you know? And so I'm like, Lord, help me because I want to minister to the people, not put up more walls. And this is how the Holy Spirit had me minister to, to our people. And I asked this question. In the middle of service, I asked this question. How many of you believe in Pele? Oh, was a funniest thing. You got to remember, a Hawaiian brought up in a culture, all of this, right? So I asked the question, how many of you believe in Pele? And you're like, kid you not, I seen hands kind of go like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Serious. Should I answer that one in church? And I kind of laughed and I said, I said this, I said, I believe, 
I believe in Pele. And they're like, whoa, then I got the double take. But then I said, listen, I believe in it. It's, there's a reality to it. Okay, you cannot deny the manifestations. You cannot deny the worship of it. But it's dark. There you go. It's demonic in nature. Why would you worship something that comes in and destroys homes? See, guys, we got to get out of this mindset. Oh, you know, yeah, it may not be based on the word of God, but if you shy away, then how are you going to be able to help people? I'm not saying go out and start slaughtering cats or anything like that. I'm just saying we need to begin to really look at this and go, whoa, wait a minute. Our God is supernatural. The prevailing worldview is supernatural. And that's what I'm going to bring to the table for us, okay? See, the worldview of the writers and readers of the Bible was a supernatural one. It was. Come on, guys. Read your Bible. How come we get selective in our supernatural understanding of the Bible? Let me ask a simple question. How many of you born again? Raise your hand. Gee, how'd you get born again? It was a supernatural act, guys. It's a work of the Spirit. Not me, not Waxer. It's a supernatural working of the Holy Spirit. But then when we start reading about, oh, that cannot be. Cannot. Oh, very strange. <laughs> See, the worldview of the writers and readers of the Bible was a supernatural one. See, what I hope I can maybe birth in us, in some of us, is that we need to think like an Israelite writer and reader of the Bible. Number one, guys, the Bible wasn't written to us. You weren't there. Neither were the church fathers. They weren't there. You know that some of the church fathers, when you study church history, and I'm not ragging on the church fathers, but you know that some of them couldn't even speak Hebrew? There's no fact. A lot of them couldn't maybe deal with the Greek. A lot of them couldn't speak Hebrew. You know that some of the church fathers were very anti-Semitic? Very let me bring one to mind. Martin Luther. The man that God used to bring about the Reformation. And you can simply Google this. Martin Luther, the Jews and their lies. Okay? It's a book he wrote. And if you, you just Google Martin Luther, quotes from Martin Luther and their li his li um, the Jews' lies. Okay? And just read some of the quotes. If I never told you this and you came across this, you're going, bro, Hitler wrote this. He was promoting burning down synagogues, burning the Torah, the Talmud, the Mishnah. Okay? Will I see Martin Luther there? Yeah. But notice something. They had their biases. They had their biases. Okay? So again, we got to go even further than the church fathers. We got to go back to the original guys. The original. Our minds need to begin to think this way. All right? Let me ask you something. Why, when you read your Bible, why are the stars, okay? When we say stars, we think stars. But why were the readers and the writers of the Bible thinking divine beings? Because we see that used, and I'll show you a few times as we go through the scriptures. What was their mindset of where the gods live, the G-O-Ds, okay? Now we're going to get some clarity in there. I'm not teaching, teaching polytheism, okay? But they had this mindset, right? They never know nothing about Yahweh Elohim, but they had gods. They had their pantheon of gods. So what was their, the, not, not the Israelite, but the surrounding world view of where did these gods live? And I'm going to show you something, that their view actually parallels the biblical view. The difference is, who is God? Okay? The, what, was the, what was their view of the wilderness? You know, we have this cliche in Christianity, right? Oh, I'm just going through my wilderness wanderings right now. Really? If you really understood what the wilderness was about, I don't think you would ever say that again. The wilderness, in the, in the original mindset of the, the, the Israelites, was a place where demons dwelled. It's in the scriptures. It's the place where the unclean animals dwelled. This was a place where there was no life. Guys, when God sentenced the first generation of Israelites 
into the wilderness. It wasn't to teach them a lesson. It was to kill them. They wandered for 40 years until that first generation died off. That's what was going on in the wilderness, guys. The Azazel of the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Some people, there's different camps, different ideas of what the Azazel was. During Yom Kippur, two goats were to be brought forward. They would cast the lots for these two goats on Yom Kippur. The lot that fell on the one goat was the one that got sacrificed for Yahweh. That's the one that got killed. Okay, this was the one sacrificed. The other one, the Azazel, and you can even go into Strong's Concordance and go and, and do some simple research on your Bible app on Strong Concordance, and they're going to mention things like, well, it was possibly a name of a demon, a desert demon. Okay? So now then the thinking becomes this. Well, did God tell him to sacrifice to a demon? They never killed the Azazel. The Azazel, the, the scapegoat, that's what you read in the English, they would transfer, symbolically transfer their sins upon the scapegoat, the Azazel, and then they would send it where? Into the wilderness, where evil and sin belongs. That was the mindset. The problem was the Azazel would wander back into the camp every now and then. <laughs> so eventually what they did, they took the Azazel and they began throwing it off the cliff. Read Luke 20, um... Luke chapter 4. It's exactly what they tried to do to Yeshua on Yom Kippur. It's all there. See, the mindset is way different. What was the perception of the serpent of Eden? How did the, the ancient Israelites per, um, perceive the Nakash in Eden? It wasn't a snake, guys. So if you get your artwork at home with the two humans, the tree, and a snake wrap around them, you might want to change that after we get done with this. So our springboard to all of this scripturally is Psalms 82. Psalms 82. Go there. Join me there in Psalms 82. Eight verses here. Let me read all eight and then we'll jump into this. God takes his stand in his own congregation. He judges in the midst of the rulers. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Vindicate the weak and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and destitute. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. They do not know, do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Hmm. Notice what was happening now with all waxer slides and informing us what's going on. Verse 6, I said, you are gods and all of you are sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, you will die like men and fall like any one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for it is thou who doest possess all the nations. Okay? Like, oh, well, what does it have to do with prophecy? What? Well, it's not so much with prophecy. It's trying to get our mind set right into the original context which was supernatural okay again when I use that term remember superior over the natural that's what it means okay so I'm going to show you a couple different um, versions of this um, passage here verse one okay you guys got it the first one the first slide okay this is what I just read out of the New American Standard 95 with the, the Hebrew there, okay? God, Elohim, takes his stand in his own edah, the congregation. He judges in the midst of the rulers, Elohim. Okay, that's what we just read, okay? This is the New King James Version of that same verse. God, Elohim, stands in the edah, the congregation of the mighty, the El, God, okay? So the... the the singularity for God there in El. He judges among the gods. The Elohim. That's there. You can't argue that stuff, okay? This is the English Standard Version. God, Elohim, has taken his place in the divine El Council. You guys getting anyone feel for this? This is not one human council here. The divine council. In the midst of the gods, the Elohim, he holds judgment now what I'm about to show you the next version is from the Jewish publication society okay 
One of the best commentaries set I have on the Torah actually comes from a non-Christian source. And how I came across this was from Chuck Misler. The insights and understanding because of the Hebrew, their, their cultural understanding, they get it. You just, they just miss that Yeshua is Messiah. Okay? They miss it. And you got to know that when you're reading this stuff. Okay? But this is the, the JPS. Elohim, God stands in the El, divine, the Edah, the assembly among the Elohim. Divine beings, he pronounces judgment. Now, is anyone feel for this? Now, I'm not talking about polytheism. That's not what this is about, okay? You, know, you might be sitting there going, say, oh, bro, what? You saying get other gods out there, David? No, that's not what I'm saying. The word of God is saying that there are divine rulers and God himself calls them Elohim. You can argue with me or you can just look at the plain reading of the scripture. That's what's there. Okay? This is what we've done with Elohim. It's not a, it's not a name. It's a title. It's a title. But because... We see in our English translation, big G-O-D, automatically we connect things to Elohim that aren't there. It's a title. Okay? It's a title. It's not a name. Jesus is his name. Christ is his title. Same idea. Same principle here. Okay? Yahweh is his name. Elohim is his title. This is how you distinguish Yahweh Elohim from the other Elohim. And where we get messed up is in the English because we see G-O-D-S, gods. This title Elohim, okay, is an umbrella over all disembodied spirit beings. The demons are called Elohim in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Angels are called Elohim. Samuel the prophet, he dies. Saul the king goes, instead of going to Yahweh, he goes to the witch of Endor to conjure up Samuel from the dead. Well, the witch is doing her thing. He, she's conjuring, and guess who comes up? Samuel. What does she call him? I see an Elohim. Disembodied spirit being. Now we can transfer this title into the human realm because we see Moses is called at times a ruler or an Elohim in the Hebrew Aaron and others that don't make them divine that's just a title to designate what they were to do their responsibilities that they were to rule and lead and judge that's what's going on here okay so let's break this thing down okay God of gods. You hear that, right? Okay? Elohim of Elohim. That's what it would be in the, the Hebrew, okay? And we know that Elohim can use, be used in the singular or it can be used in the plural, okay? The I am in the transliteration is like adding an S in the English, okay? That's simple, all right? Okay, by the way, guys, I'm 58 years old. I still cannot spell and do arithmetic, okay? I'm serious. My wife has to fill out applications for me. All right? And the reason why I'm sharing that with you, if I can figure this stuff out to the power of the Holy Spirit, guess what? You can too. Okay? Don't sit there. Whoa, bro, what Bible college you in? You know what Bible college I went? The Bible school of Waxa. Okay? <laughs> I had 15 years under my professor. My whole point is this. Don't think yourself low, low. Because if you do, then you belittle your God. Okay? So we see this in the scriptures. God himself says he is the Elohim of Elohim. Okay? Look at this in Deuteronomy 10, 17. Okay? For Yahweh, and I'm going to use the Hebrew names and titles more than the English because it really changes your perspective on the scriptures. Okay? For Yahweh, our Elohim, he is Elohim of Elohim. This is Moses saying this stuff. And Lord of Lords, the great and mighty, the awesome El, God, who does not regard persons or take 
rewards. Listen. Let me help us try and understand this, this, how important this is, okay? Here's Moses saying that Elohim, Yahweh Elohim, is above the other Elohim. We read God. We're talking about spirit beings on this side. We're talking about Yahweh Elohim over here, okay? Let's get that one straight in our head, okay? So, again, show of hand times, participation time, okay? How many of you think that Captain America, okay, is faster and stronger than me. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Come on, all of you. Hold your hand up. Keep your hands up. How many of you think that I'm Captain America? You guys all lose. Captain America isn't real, guys. <laughs> so if when Moses was saying uh, that Yahweh is the Elohim of Elohim, what do you think he was talking about? Rocks and stones? He was talking about other spirit beings that he created. See guys, how important this stuff is? We put it back in its supernatural context. How belittling would that be to our God? How can God give glory if he's standing there saying, I'm the Elohim, I'm Elohim, and he pointed one, I want statue on a piece of rock. Now again, I'm not saying there are multiple gods out there. I'm saying there are beings that God himself says they're real. And the Bible calls them Elohim. It's a title. By the way, all you guys who can raise your hand about Captain America being greater than me, you guys in order bentos tomorrow. <laughs> no bento for you. So back to our text in Psalms 82, okay? Who is Yahweh Elohim talking to in Psalms 82? Who is he talking to? Obviously, he's talking to these spirit beings. You can argue that one all you like, but if you just look at the text, that's what's going on here. He's talking to these spirit beings, okay? But what is the context? Well, let's pick it back up. Verse 1 again. God takes his stand in his own congregation. He judges in the midst of the rulers. That's Elohim again. Okay. He's judging them. He's judging these Elohim. What is the indictment? Well, the indictment is verse 2. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? No. This is probably where I'm going to get myself in trouble, okay? Which isn't new for me, and Waxer knows that, okay? But there is, within the scholarly realms, this title that they, is called the Divine Council, okay? And people automatically jump on that and go, why would God need one counsel? He's omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. Why would he need one counsel? My simple response to that, why does he need humans? Why does he need us going out and sharing his truth? See, God has two families, guys. The spirit realm, the spirit beings, and us, the human beings. And in this realm, just like in this realm, he made them with his attributes. Why do you think they can rebel? Because they have free will. Now, does God need their counsel? Obviously not. Why does God allow us to partake? Because that's the heart of our God. I work with koa all the time. I, I make wooden stuff. I make cool stuff. Um, but I cannot make a koa, koa tree, can I? Okay? I cannot make a koa tree. But I can take what God created and co-create with him. And make cool things. That's his heart. That's the heart of the scriptures, guys. None of you can create life on your own. But God gave humanity the ability to co-create by, pro by procreating, didn't he? Think about that one, how radical that one is. That you as a human being have the ability to create another human being. But the process was done and established by Yahweh Elohim. Because God loves Fellowship with his creation, 
human being, spirit beings. Okay? Keep your finger here. Here, I'll go take you to one strange one. Okay? Go to 1 Kings with me. 1 Kings 22. First Kings 22. Let me give you the background so because of time and everything. So Ahab is the king of the northern kingdom of Israel at that time. He wants to go to war with the, um, Aram. So he calls up Jehoshaphat who is a godly king. Ahab is one of the most wicked kings the northern kingdom ever had. They all had only wicked kings in the northern kingdom by the way. But he was one of the most wicked. So he... he, he I was going to say he texts Jehoshaphat. Yeah, right. <laughs> Supernatural, huh? No. So he sends messengers and asks Jehoshaphat if he can ally with him. Okay? So Jehoshaphat goes, okay. They come up. He comes up north. They're having their war council meeting. Jehoshaphat, I mean, excuse me, ah Ahab is bringing all his prophets, his false prophets of Baal and all of this, and they're all prophesying in his favor. Go about it. You're going to win. Garen's give them. And that's how they talk, you know, back then. No. <laughs> but Jehoshaphat, he's sitting there going, you guys don't any prophets left of Yahweh up here or what? He goes, yeah. Get this one guy, bro, Micaiah. But he never, this guy, I don't like him. He never prophesies in my favor. Jehoshaphat goes, bring him anyway. So he brings him. Brings him in. And immediately, Micaiah begins to mock Ahab by saying, yeah, I give him, brother. Go, go, you're going to win. And Ahab knows this, okay? So pick it up in verse 16. Then the king said to him, how many times must I adore you, adore you to speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of Yahweh? So he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep which have no shepherd. And Yahweh said, these have no master. Let each of them return to his house. So this is not no longer in his favor, okay? And he knows it. Ahab knows this. Look at verse 18. Then the king of Israel, who is Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? Then Micaiah goes, You really want to know the truth, brother? Here's the truth. And Micaiah said, Therefore, hear the word of Yahweh. I saw Yahweh sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right and on his left. And Yahweh said, who will entice Ahab to go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said this, while another said that. Here. There's Yahweh Elohim and these hosts of heaven, which is another term that some of the scholars use to, to identify the, the, the divine council. They're around Yahweh. And Yahweh goes, what do you guys think? How are we going to take Ahab out? That's in the scripture, guys. What are we going to do with this guy? So he says, you know, someone will come out. We're going to do this. I said, nah, not now, brother. Sit down. He says, no, it's not what we're going to do. Okay? But look at verse 21. Then a spirit came forth and stood before Yahweh and said, I will entice him. And Yahweh said to him, how? And he said, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Then he said, you are to entice him and also prevail, go and do so. This is also recorded in Chronicles, guys. Does God need their counsel? Does he need their manao? No. But he, waiting, what will we do, boys? How are we gonna take care of this guy? You ever thought of your God that way? It's in the scripture, it's in his word. It was recorded for us. It wasn't written to us, but it's there. What do you do with stuff like this? Either you just brush over it because you're like, whoa, whoa, too strange. Or you start conjuring other stuff to make it fit. Or you just read the simple text and go, whoa, that's supernatural. That's going on over there. Look. Does God need their counsel? No. But he does want their input. You ever thought of your prayer life that way? Notice, they don't get the last say. 
Yahweh gets the last say. Our prayer life is the same thing. We come to God, God, I need a million dollars. Go sit down, David, think this one over. <laughs> come back, Lord, I need a thousand dollars. Okay, that's my will for you. Why is it any different? Why is it any different? Why, why do we go, oh, we're too strange? Our prayer life is exactly that. It's not to get God to bow to our will. It's us bow to God's will. And that's what we see going on here. I can show you this in Daniel. With the watchers. And Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar that this was decreed by the watchers. But then later he goes, no, this is actually decreed by Yahweh. This goes on in that realm. It says nothing to do with polytheism. This has to do with scripture, guys. Yeah. See, input is given, but it has to align with God's will. No different than our prayer life, guys. Okay. Verse 2, back in our text, back in Psalms 82. Okay. So God takes his stand in his own congregation. He judges in the midst of the Elohim. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? So there's the indictment by Yahweh. Against these spirit beings, against these Elohim, okay? And what is the indictment? Well, the indictment, excuse me, okay? God's indictment against the Elohim is based on their rule. Notice that. On their rule. How long will you judge sapat in the Hebrew? It means to rule, to govern over, Okay? It means to judge. Because so Yahweh is talking to these spirit beings. How long will you judge, rule, um, govern unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? So God says, look, now this is an indictment against you guys. What you're doing is unjust. It's perverse, actually. And you show this partiality to the wicked. Gee, let's run some of those slides again. How did we get here? Verse 4 on 3. Vindicate the wicked and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and destitute. Rescue the wicked and needy. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. See verse 3 and 4 is how they, um, excuse me, verse 2 is how they are ruling. Verse 3 and 4 is God's desire of how they should rule. Isn't that the heart of God? Isn't that the picture of God? Vindicate the wicked, the fatherless, do justice to the afflicted. This is the Torah. And these beings are not doing it. And God is condemning them for it. Look at the rest of it. Because the, verse 5 is the result of what's going on on the earth the hum, and the humanity. They do not know nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the world, earth are shaken. Guys, if this ain't shaking the world right now, then you're asleep. But the question is, how did we get here? It's not just man, guys. Supernatural in origins. Look at what he says here. I said you are... God's Elohim and all of you are sons of the most high or your version might say sons of God Those verse 3 and 4 is God's heart's desire for humanity they're not doing it verse 5 is a plight of man's ignorance verse 6 and 7 Elohim sentence upon the Elohim look at that I said you are God's and all of you are sons of the most high Yahweh is making the identification of this group, guys. Not the prophets, not me. Yahweh himself. I said, you are Elohim. All of you are Benai Elohim. Son of God, um, sons of God. We'll talk about that in the next session a little bit more. But look at verse 7. Here's the judgment. Nevertheless, you will die like men. And fall like any one of the prince, princes. Any one of the human rulers. See, you will fall like any prince. Your divine status. God is telling this spirit beings that are supposed to be taking care of business. Then they're not. Your divine status will not protect you from the sentence. 
amazing, huh? It's the same sentence as the ones that they rule over, man. You die just like men now. And death, guys, actually has very little to do with the physical. I know we all got to face death, and maybe not. Maybe the rapture comes, hopefully, for that one. But death really has to do with separation. James puts it this way in the book of James. He says, the body without the spirit is dead. The Bible talks about a second death. It's not talking about annihilation. It's talking about being eternally separated from God. And God pronounces judgment upon these beings. Yahweh pronounced the judgment. See, he says, you will fall like any prince. Your divine status will not protect you from the sentence. The same sentence which is upon man, you and me our separation from God and then we have to face physical death. But I want to share something with you guys. Why this is important to understand Elohim in its Hebraic context. See, we read the English and we read like, especially in Deuteronomy, Moses has this phrase, your God. In the Hebrew it would be your Elohim. Guys, this, this statement is, it's implying something there. It's implying that, look, you have your God, your Elohim. So if they have their Elohim, guess what? That's implying there's other Elohim. This is why in Deuteronomy alone, that phrase, your Elohim, is used 254 times by Moses. And I want you tonight, like I said, I hope this will be birthed in you tonight. The next time you read your scriptures and you see that phrase, your God, your Elohim, you just go like, oh yeah, yeah, you are. You see, your salvation is a loyalty issue, guys. Your Elohim saved you, your God, Yeshua HaMashiach. And God, through the scriptures, is saying, there's me, the Elohim of Elohim, Yahweh, and get these other ones. Why did Israel fail? Because they went after the other ones. Not gods. There's no polytheism. But there are other beings ruling. Why do you think Paul talks about it that way? Power, the principalities of this world, the God of this world, that kind of terminology. He wasn't talking about stones, rocks. He's talking about spirit beings that's ruling over this creation. Okay, now watch. You might be going, oh, no, wait, wait, what do you mean? God? Well, look at verse eight, eight now. Arise, O Elohim, judge the earth, for it is thou who doest possess all the nations. Now, either we got a radical contradiction here in the scriptures, or we got something very, very, very profound going on here. Asap, the, the, the writer of this psalm, and then finally, after going through all of this, he, look, he cries out in verse 80, Elohim, rise, judge the earth, for it is thou who does possess all the nations. The word there, Possess. Your, your, your version, I don't know what version you got, but your version might say something like possession, possess, inherit. It's all the same word in the Hebrew. It's the word nahal. It gets translated three different ways in the English, okay? It all means the same thing. But why, if God owns it all, why does he have to rise up and judge the nations in order to inherit it? Think that one through. Why do we have scriptures like this? Psalms 89, 11. The heavens are yours, the earth also is yours. The world and all that is in it, you have founded them. Psalms 50, verse 10 and 12. For every beast of the field is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all, the, all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you for the world and its fullness are mine. So either we get a contradiction going on because the psalmist is saying, rise up, Elohim, judge the nations so you can inherit the nations. We either got a contradiction. We've got something radically going on here that maybe we have not understood yet.
You want to know what it is? You guys want to know? Get out your pen. Get out your pen. You're taking notes already. You got your pen out. Write this down. Ready? This is radical, okay? You got to come back tomorrow. <laughs> My time is up. And we're going to carry on with this. My heart is to help us as God's people understand more of him through his word. That's it. I may fumble and stumble at times, just like you do, just like everybody else does. We have not arrived, guys. None of us. Okay? Our God is right on schedule. All right?